Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the plenary panel on China, Asia, and the United States as part of America and the World 2015. It's always good to, uh, to start with a, a quote from that great American uh, diplomat, Yogi Berra, who said, uh, it's, uh, it's always difficult to predict the future, especially uh, to make predictions, especially when you're talking about the future. Um, that that uh, is not something I coined, the, coined this week as a, an opening for a speech. That was uh, Secretary of State John Kerry two days ago at John Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies as he began to talk about China-U.S. relations. Uh, he said that there were two things certain about uh, the Asia-Pacific theater, and one of those was that uh, it's one of the most promising places on the planet, and some some skeptics may ask themselves, compared to what, given uh, other U.S. entanglements around the world, but uh, he appeared uh, optimistic in talking about the upcoming uh, summit that uh, is scheduled in China. He also said that America's future in security and, and prosperity uh, lied in the relationship with uh, the countries of the Pacific Rim and, and uh, the Pacific uh, region. Uh, three weeks ago, I was uh, privileged to participate in World Affairs Councils of America leadership mission to China where we uh, didn't become instant specialists in China by any means and, and uh, we were not expected to and we arrived with many questions. But we did get to peel back the onion a little bit and learn some things about China that uh, you don't get simply by reading about it or talking to others about it but by going to ministries and think tanks and, uh, and organizations dealing with climate change, uh, organizations dealing with uh, urbanization and development, the universities. Uh, so it was a, a wonderful opportunity to learn a little bit more about China. And maybe we left with uh, more questions than we arrived with, but we did get uh, some of them answered. Secretary Kerry, in his remarks, uh, referred to the APEC, the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit that uh, will be held in Beijing, and President Obama will be departing on Sunday to attend the summit. And this will be a, a key opportunity for the United States to uh, further the dialogue with China, not just on uh, uh, trade liberalization and economic issues, but also uh, to, uh, to further the conversation between the relatively new President uh, Xi Jinping, who has been in power for about a year, and if, uh, if you think back to the question that was posed at the end of the luncheon, uh, the consolidation of, uh, of power in China is, is one of the questions that uh, many specialists have on their minds. The, uh, the Chinese-U.S. relationship is complex, uh, it involves uh, military, political, economic, cultural, uh, academic, uh, and other sectors of, uh, of the relationship. Uh, today we're going to explore some of those, uh, and we have a distinguished panel here who uh, are prepared to take on some of those questions. Uh, first, uh, we have our moderator, uh, our host, uh, President of the World Affairs Council of America, Bill Clifford, who you all have uh, gotten to know so far in the conference, and he'll be uh, uh, hosting uh, this panel. Uh, with us uh, today, Evan uh, Feigenbaum, who's the Vice Chairman of the Paulson Institute, which uh, counts themselves as a think and do tank, and they focus on uh, economic growth and environmental uh, uh, pursuits between the U.S. and China. Uh, David Finkelstein, Vice President and Director of China Studies at the CNA Corporation, who heads up uh, studies at uh, the Center for Naval Analysis uh, here in the, the Washington area that provides information and analyses to uh, DOD, uh, especially to the Navy and Marine Corps. Also, uh, David Shambaugh, who's uh, director of the uh, China Policy Program and a professor of international studies and author of the, the recent book, China Goes Global. Uh, I would refer you to your program to get more detailed information on the backgrounds of uh, these distinguished uh, speakers, but in the interest of time, I won't go through their uh, extensive uh, accomplishments, but uh, rather just turn it over to Bill Clifford. We have a very short period of time and a lot of, a lot of distance to cover. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Let's get right to it. I'm thrilled to be here with this distinguished 
group of gentlemen. We're going to talk about China's transformation under Xi. With first, David Shamba, I'd like to ask you, how has he been able to consolidate power so rapidly? What is his uh, agenda, and where do you think he will, do you think he will accomplish the Chinese dream? Okay, well, uh, first of all, Bill, nice to be here, and good to see some familiar faces in the audience. I've had the pleasure of speaking at several of your chapters around the country, and it's nice to have you all here to the mothership in Washington. <laughs> um, but it's also nice to see you, and, and I commend you on the work you're doing in educating Americans about international relations and, and U.S. foreign policy and engagement with the world. So very pleased to be here and invited to speak to your annual uh, meeting together with my two good friends and, and colleagues. Um, well, let me start, if I can, on the question you just asked me about Xi Jinping um, and, and his uh, power consolidation, and more generally, if I can, for a minute or two, talk about how I see the internal situation in China, as my colleagues are going to talk about economics and national security, respectively. I'd like to say a few words about the domestic political uh, scene. So um, I would summarize it with a, with a metaphor that the Chinese use called Y ink ne rot, hard on the outside, soft on the inside, roughly how it translates. Um, and I think it's an apt idiom for the state of the Chinese political system today. It seems very strong on the outside, um, but if you dig a little bit, uh, you find, or at least I find, a substantial number of weaknesses in the system. Um, of course, you can probably say that about any country, including our own, too. Um, but let me start with the hard uh, on the outside part and then a little bit on the soft side. Uh, so you have to start with Xi Jinping. He is a a leader who certainly gives the appearance of being a strong leader, and he's trying to consolidate his control over uh, different bureaucratic uh, systems and indeed the entire system. Uh, he is very unlike his predecessors, uh, most recently Hu Jintao, who was a very weak, operatic kind of leader, who never did, I would argue, really consolidate his control over certain parts of the system, the military, for example, uh, which Dave Finkelstein will speak to. He's not a, Xi Jinping is different from Jiang Zemin, who was the two-time removed leader, still alive, I think 87 years old now. Uh, Jiang Zemin was a coalition builder, I would argue, very good at assembling bureaucratic coalitions and co-opting them and adopting their agendas. That's not Xi Jinping either. Uh, Xi Jinping is not a Mao-like figure, thank goodness. You know, Mao was a real fickle, tyrannical, uh, and charismatic ruler. Uh, Xi Jinping, I see to be much more like Deng Xiaoping, a, a strong-willed, strong-armed, you might say, uh, ruler. Um, and he's trying to um, put his, uh, his own imprint on a number of policies. So first of all, this is a strong leader. And it's a strong leader with a vision, very unlike, again, his predecessor. Two years ago, many of us China watchers sat around speculating about what China's next leader would be and what that leader needed to be. And I think there was a consensus that China's next leader needed to be strong and with a vision. Well, here we are two years later, and they've got a strong leader with a vision. Part of that vision is the China dream. That's actually the most vague part of his vision. But if you look at the third plenum reform documents of last year, which Evan will speak to, um, you look at any number of speeches he's given, in fact, he's just come out last two weeks ago with a 300-page volume of his selected works with a picture of him on the cover that reminds one more of North Korea than of China. But in that volume and in his speeches over the last two years, he has sketched out, I think, a fairly comprehensive vision. How sophisticated a vision it is is another question. But the real question with any leader's visions in any country, <laughs> as we've learned in this country in recent years, is can you implement your vision? And Xi Jinping is uh, trying to implement through force of will his vision, but he's encountering, like leaders in all countries, encounters pushback. And he's getting substantial pushback, I would argue, in a number of areas. And it's to be determined who's going to prevail, him or the system. But China is not a democracy, to be sure, <laughs> far from it. But it has uh, entrenched interests and interest group politics 
um, that are uh, pushing back against some of the reforms that he's trying to implement. Um, so what are some of his reforms, very briefly? Uh, again, I'm not going to talk about the economic reforms um, because they're, they're quite, on paper at least, uh, very promising. This third plenum document of a year ago, very promising, but there has been very little lived off very little on the implementation side over the last year. His anti-corruption campaign is probably what is uh, most written about, um, and, and people abroad seem to know the most about. In fact, in China, it's certainly caught uh, the attention of various cadres in the system. There have been, I read the other day, 7,000, I believe, cadres investigated uh, over the last year for suspected of corruption. Many of them are now been being brought to account. That includes a couple pretty high-level people, too. A man named Xu Tsai Ho, <coughs> who was the number two in the military, um, and a number of others, names I won't, won't bother you with. But the point I want to make about the anti-corruption campaign is it's at least as much a purge, a political purge, as it is an anti-corruption campaign. It's a very selective, um, so far, a very selective um, uh, purge of individuals um, who have been corrupt, but the corruption is so pervasive in that system, it's really a question of who you go after um, and who you choose to go after, because it's, it's so widespread. So who, is, who are they going after? And this is the interesting thing to me. They're going after um, those in the Jiang Zemin network. Jiang Zemin was the leader two times ago, so over 10 years ago. As I say, he's 87 years old. He's the grandfather, or you might call the godfather, of Chinese politics. And his network is pervasive throughout the military system, the state system, and certainly the party system. So it doesn't strike me as very smart, politically, for, Jiang, for Xi Jinping to be taking down Jiang Zemin's network while Jiang Zemin is still alive and active, even though in retirement. So this is um, something to watch, in my view, and it may prove his undoing. So uh, that's sort of one set of challenges. The last thing I'd like to talk about, I guess, is on the soft side, if you will, or hard soft. Well, one other element of hardness we see is repression. China is under extreme repression today across the whole um, civil sphere, civil society sphere, media sphere, intellectual sphere, academic sphere, social media sphere, um, dissent sphere, that's not new, but it's gotten worse. Uh, I, would, uh, I would go so far as to say the repression in China today is the worst it has been since the immediate aftermath of the June 4th massacre in 1989, during the early 90s, when it was pretty severe. I was living there at that time, I can tell you. Um, and it's not that bad now, but it's as, it's as close to that as we've seen in the last 20 years. So why this crackdown? Why this repression? And I would argue there's the softness. It really shows insecurities of the party about a whole number of issues, challenges that they confront. Um, ethnic challenges, economic challenges, unrest, dissent. Um, they can't, they're having a difficult time controlling <coughs> increasingly volatile and unstable, I would argue, society. And so they're using the most coercive methods possible to control this increasingly diverse, volatile society. But that's really a sign of weakness, not of strength, I would argue. Um, and they're taking a very zero-sum approach towards uh, different social trends in society. And unlike they had been prior to 2009, which they were taking a more positive-sum approach, engaging these groups now they're just trying to crack down on them. So on the outside, that's strong, right? That's hard. But it really reflects, I think, a weakness of the party um, and challenge, very serious challenges to the party uh, from without and the corruption campaign from within. So I, I see this duality, I guess, in, in China uh, today. And it's going to be interesting to watch uh, going forward how it plays out. But uh, Xi Jinping. Um, is shaking up the system. Let me just finish on that point. He's certainly shaking the system, and he is a strong-willed individual. And we'll see the, s the extent to which the system shakes him, however. <laughs> well, stop. Thank you. <laughs> Evan Figenbaum, the liberalization that has occurred has been largely in the economic sphere, and China's almost uh, becoming, soon to become, uh, 
on par with the U.S. economically in terms of output anyway, pure output, but not as rich as us. Uh, talk about that, pow that economic power and China's ability to project on the international stage, and also talk about, please, the, uh, the challenges that it faces to shape its economy to a more, say, consumer-driven from export-driven mode. Sure. Um, well, like David, I'm delighted to be here. Good to see all of you. I'm actually leaving for China tomorrow, so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I was able to get here for this. Um, you know, David just described a political system that's somewhat in transition. And um, the Chinese economy is not just somewhat in transition, it's considerably in transition. And if you go back, I don't know, even two years ago, and you picked up a newspaper, uh, you know, the Chicago Tribune, or even the Financial Times, and you read about China, the narrative that you were kind of beat over the head with was of this relentlessly successful economy that had just gone from strength to strength to strength. That they lifted you know, a few hundred million people out of poverty. They'd become the workshop to the world. They're taking everybody's jobs, and they're doing technology, and they're projecting their economic power all over the world. And that was the narrative. And they're doing it largely through state-backed finance of state-owned companies. You know, and like many popular narratives, there's a lot of tr elements of truth in that narrative. But also like many popular narratives, uh, there are some problems with that. Um, and I would flag two. Um, one, that like all of these conventional narratives, uh, a narrative like that can obscure as much as it enlightens and enlivens. So if, you've, if any of you have been to China, you see the incredible construction of buildings and bridges and roads and airports, amazing infrastructure. But that came at a cost of enormous debt-backed finance in China that has saddled enterprises and local governments that built the infrastructure with just a gigantic mountain of debt uh, that the government now has to cover as a guarantor against insolvency. Um, you see Chinese banks have huge profits on their balance sheets. These are some of the most profitable banking institutions in the world. But ordinary Chinese who put their money in a deposit account in a bank get a negative return on their savings because interest rates don't keep pace with inflation. So state-owned enterprises, yes, state capitalism in China, but actually most employment in China is generated by the private sector, as much as 75% of employment now. And so these state-owned enterprises, not the big central ones, but the thousands at the local level, they're extremely inefficient. Um, and they're a drag on growth and a drag on finance. And so, you know, as I said, like many of these narratives, while it enlivens something, it also obscures a lot. The other problem with this narrative, frankly, is that China's own leaders stopped believing it, um, I'd say, about five or six years ago, because a number of the problems uh, and dysfunctions in the model began to bubble to the surface. Right? This is a high growth economy, but it is energy intensive and energy inefficient. And so one cost of that growth has been enormous environmental degradation. And if any of you have been outside walking down a street in Beijing lately, you know what I mean. Just look at the air. Um, that cost cannot be hidden from anybody, including the leaders who have to live there. Um, then there's the fact that you have a 20th century country and a 21st century country in the same country. Mm -hmm. And if you've traveled around China, you can go from this glorious modern skyline of Shanghai uh, to places in Western China that look more like they're out of the 1960s or 1970s. Um, and on the back of that, you also have this problem of inequality that many of those who have reaped the fruits of economic success over the last 30 years uh, are people connected to the government or people connected to big corporates. And that level of inequality, not just of wealth, but inequality of opportunity and a sense of injustice and fairness about who's reaping the benefits of this system has been much more difficult to hide. Now, ironically, the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 actually exacerbated this sense that something was wrong. And the reason I say that's ironic is because you may remember that China came out of the financial crisis earlier and stronger than almost any other major economy in the world. Right? They went from almost no growth and even contraction, I think, in one quarter, uh, back to a path of rapid growth again. So how can you say, you know, how did this exacerbate the problem? Now, David hangs out with national security people. If you talk to army people in China or foreign policy people in China, they look at this financial crisis and they say, boy, this confirmed everything we think about shifts in the balance of power globally. China's rising. The United States is declining. The balance of power is shifting in China's favor. Uh, and they like to thump their chest a little bit about how post-2008 and 9, China became so strong. 
But if you talk to economic policymakers in China, they look at the exact same set of events and trends and reach completely the opposite conclusion. Why? Because China's success over the last 30 years was really built on two pillars. One was exports, and exports to big economies in Europe and the United States that are facing either slow growth or no growth, as far as the eye can see, uh, or austerity, as far as the eye can see, in the case of Europe. So if you have an export-driven economy, China didn't exactly have an export-driven economy, but it relied heavily on exports. You can't count on export-driven growth to those traditional markets. You need to find a new source to squeeze growth out of your system. The second pillar, and really the more important pillar than exports, was what I would say, I'd call it investment-led growth. Basically, investment, mostly by the government, mostly in fixed assets, as I said, like infrastructure. Um, and this introduced all kinds of distortions and imbalances in the Chinese system. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, this enormous debt burden that's sitting on the balance sheets of local governments. Um, by the last count, by the Chinese government's own count, it's about 20 trillion renminbi. That's six, six renminbi to the dollar, so you do the math. That's a pretty big mountain of debt if you're the central government and you have to guarantee this against insolvency. Um, so for Chinese leaders, the flaws in the model were very clear. And what that meant is they needed to find new sources of growth. And they also need to shift their economy onto a more sustainable trajectory. It may mean slower growth, but higher quality growth, more sustainable growth, more long-term growth. And what that means, to go to David's point about politics, is that you know, there's something that reform isn't, and there's something that economic reform is in China. What it isn't is an intellectual problem. It is not an intellectual problem for all the reasons that I just said. Chinese leaders understand very well that that model that was so successful for them is not sustainable, uh, given the situation in the global economy. What it is is a political problem. Because as David said, when you become this successful over a period of 25, 30 years, vested interests build up within the system who have benefited, especially from the way economic decision making and resources were allocated uh, and from the financial system. And as I said, when I gave you the example of bank deposits, ordinary Chinese were not really among those winners. Uh, and if you're a politician, that's destabilizing. Okay, so, uh, so the good news is they understand very well they need to shift their economy to something else. The bad news, as David said, it's hard to do that. And it's harder still, because when I moved to Washington in, 2000, China, in the year 2001, China had about a $1 trillion economy. Now it has a $10 trillion economy okay, in just 14 years. You take a $10 trillion economy, and you try to shift it to a completely different growth model, putting aside the fact that you can't do that by next Tuesday, uh, it requires a lot of really big changes in everything, in the way capital is allocated in the way industrial policy decisions are made, because China has industrial policy, uh, in the way the private sector can compete with the state sector. And so, as David said, when he mentioned this so-called third plenum that took place in 2013, <coughs> Chinese leaders made a series of big decisions uh, about what they wanted their economy to look like down the road. Um, what do they want it to look like? They want this to be an economy that's driven more by domestic consumption than by export-led growth. The theory being that richer Chinese with more disposable income uh, will spend more, consumption will rise, uh, and also that you can generate more productivity uh, from people who have more disposable income in their pockets. So consumption-led growth. Now, consumption's growing rapidly in China, household consumption. It's about 7 7.5% a year. But compared to other major economies, it's very low. It's hovered around 35 36%. The United States is somewhere like 65, 70. I think India is in the mid 40s. So this is a very low consumption economy. So that's one thing they want to do. Um, a second is uh, more energy, uh, less energy intensive and more environmentally friendly growth. That means cleaner industry, moving industry up the value chain. Um, a third thing is citizens who, have, who are more productive in the workforce. And their solution to that is, I think somebody mentioned urbanization. One of their big solutions to that is urbanization. You free up uh, people to move from rural areas to cities, for, ex for example, through land reforms that allow them to use land as collateral for bank lending. Then they move to cities, they take jobs that are higher value add, they get paid more, they become more productive, and economics has a lot to say about urban productivity. So that's the, that's the theory, that's the idea. Um, you also open sectors to competition. If the private sector is generating 75% of employment, why wouldn't you want the private sector to have more opportunities to generate employment? 
So you have a lot of sectors in China that are closed. They're basically monopolies or they're oligopolies. So, so one idea the leaders have is how do we break these monopolies? We demonopolize sectors like oil and gas refining and let private sector players that are more efficient compete in these areas. So that's the theory. But the problem is that, as David said, there are all of these powerful political interest groups that are going to resist this. And they are resisting this. And so um, the most important decision about the economy that Chinese leaders have taken in the last couple of years is right at the top of this document in the plenum. They said they want the market to play not just an important role in the Chinese economy, but they said, and this is in quotation marks, the decisive role in the Chinese economy. The market will be decisive. This is in a supposedly socialist economy. The market will be decisive. OK, well, if the market is going to be decisive, then the market has to do things in China that it has not hitherto done. And the state will have to retreat, to give you some examples. The way prices are set, the price of money, for example. What's the price of money? In simplest terms, it's the interest rate. All right, you, you get interest rate. That's the term is the price of money when you get a bank loan. Um, interest rates on lending uh, have basically been freed up in China. But as I said, interest rates on deposits have not. And what's more, China lacks a system of deposit insurance uh, to put, and so they need to put that architecture in place. But as they move toward liberalized interest rates, the price of money will be set more by the market. That is a very hard change for this state to assimilate. Um, the price of resources in the society. Let me give you an example. The way power is priced or water is priced, or gas is priced at the pump. How is gas priced at the pump for you? When you pull your car into a gas station, it's based on a whole variety of factors, including supply and demand, uh, and also what's happening in global geopolitics, the way you buy oil. In China, China buys oil and gas in the global market, so it's paying prices that are determined by market trends. But then it has price controls that then control prices at the pump. And the problem with that is for big oil companies in China, they complain about this a lot because they say they're, moving, they're losing all this money on their upstream investments because of these price controls. But more, uh, every time anybody anticipates a price change, they start to hoard gasoline in China. So it's also extremely inefficient for the economy. So again, these inefficiencies are baked into the way things are priced. Uh, power pricing is another one, very inefficient. And also, power tariffs are controlled for state-owned enterprises. So are land prices. People don't get fair market value for their land. If you don't get fair market value for your land, you don't pick up and move to cities. Um, so these are the tests that they're facing. Can they let the market decide in a system where the market has not decided? So you have what they call a socialist market economy. Mm -hmm. And the tests are going to be with things like prices, um, uh, the fiscal system, um, and I'll just give you one example there, and then I'll wrap up. Why do I say the fiscal system? Remember, I talked about all this debt. So um, all of you, you come from all over the country. Your schools are probably play, paid for with property taxes. If your mayor wants to build infrastructure in your city, how do they do it? They issue a general obligation bond. People can buy the bond, or you have covered bonds. You have different. You basically have a debt market. You have a municipal market here. Yeah. Um, there is no muni debt market in China um, because uh, the government has not wanted to give local governments the power to issue debt. Part of that is ideological. It's an aversion to that kind of federalism. Uh, part of it is just fear. Remember I said all these local governments have all this debt sitting on their balance sheets. So if you give them the power to issue bonds, you have a moral hazard problem, huge moral hazard problem. How do you monitor that, especially when you're the guarantor against insolvency? So, but they don't have a muni market. So if you don't have a muni market and you're a mayor and you need to build infrastructure, and China, quite apart from infrastructure, has a lot of what we used to call in this country unfunded mandates. You know, for instance, health care. Improve health care for people in your city. But the central government will only pay for about 48, 49 percent of that cost. And will pass all that cost back on to you. So how do you pay for that if you're a mayor or you're a governor? Well, you can't do the general obligation, but you can't do bond because you don't have a mini market. Property tax? No property taxes in China. Pilot programs, only two cities in this whole country. Shanghai and a city called Chongqing in western China. So maybe they'll develop a property tax. So how do you do it? Well, you got two options. One is you take land. Uh, real estate prices are through the roof. So what they do is they take land, uh, usually from people living on the land, usually out in the exurbs, so peasants or kind of suburban dwellers. You seize their land. You pay them less than fair market value. Uh, and then you sell their land for high prices to developers. Okay? That's bad because it produces social unrest. 
Uh, it also may impose a certain unrest because people are having their land seized. But quite apart from the question of social unrest, which bothers the leaders for the reasons David said, it also makes your whole municipal finance market very dependent on land prices, which are extremely volatile, and on real estate markets, which are also extremely volatile in any country. Another way you can do it is you can, shut up, you can set up kind of a local investment vehicle that's off the books. And so they have all these shadowy local finance vehicles where it kind of works for the local government, but it isn't the local government. And they issue these... We're going to get into different shadows. Okay. <laughs> and they issue these bonds. But who's the guarantor against that bond? How do you buy a bond? You have no transparency on the budget. You have no transparency on tax. So China needs these things. So to make the market decisive, they really need to change very fundamentally the relationship between the market and the state. What does the market do? What does the state do? And the test for me over the next couple of years is whether China moves away from being what I call an administrative state to being more of a, what I would call a regulatory state where the state does what the state does in most market systems. It sets the rules, it monitors compliance, it handles enforcement, and it has a legal system. And by a legal system, I don't mean the constitutional system where the Communist Party is going to surrender power to the rule of law and be judged by independent courts. That's not realistic. But I mean, you know, courts that adjudicate contracts fairly or can, you know, if a, if a trust product defaults, uh, there's some redress in the legal system. And these are, the, these are the kind of tests China's facing. But the bottom line, I would say for you, you, you know, if you read a paper, that story about the Chinese juggernaut that you had from a few years ago, that story uh, is much more complicated. Um, but you have a parallel narrative now where a lot of people say, oh, China's going to fall off the cliff. And they often say, you know, any minute now. Um, if you were an investor, if any of you were an investor, that would mean you would just kind of short everything in China. And nobody's ever made any money in China by shorting everything in China. Um, so this is a very complicated process to turn an economy this large towards something else. And the last thing I'd say is just the good news for the United States is, because there's all this trade friction between the two countries, if China does what it needs to do for the completely self-interested reasons that I just said, then the structure of its economy is going to be one that actually jibes much better with the structure of the American economy. A more consumption-driven economy is one that the United States can export to. If, if any of you are from a farm state like Iowa or Nebraska, Iowa exports to China are up 1,060% in the last 10 years. Why? Because more disposable income means more pro animal protein in the diet. More consumption means more exports of farm products, of high-tech goods, of all of these things. So, you know, Amer the United States will continue to pressure China on all sorts of things. But, you know, the Chinese don't need the American pressure in the sense that they have very good self-interested reasons for doing the things they need to do. And if they do that, which is no mean feat and no easy challenge, we're actually going to be looking at a very different Chinese economy 10 years from now. And the question is whether this guy that David was talking about is strong enough uh, to overcome those vested interests and get this done. But the, the good news is you can't do it without that strength of leadership. So at least they have that ingredient in play. Thank you. In the transitions that you're talking about, you've revealed uh, contradictions both in the economic and political spheres. Those contradictions are also evident in uh, diplomacy and national security. Mm -hmm. On one hand, you see China trying to develop relations with near neighbors, the Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road, and pipelines and transportation linkages and all that. On the other hand, they rattle sabers in the East and South Chinese Seas. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and they've quieted down, almost like uh, getting, trying to get rid of pollution ahead of the Beijing games. They're, 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 they've been relatively calm ahead of APEC and these big meetings. Dave Finkelstein, tell us about the rise of China, the peaceful rise. Is it peaceful? Uh, where, where is the strength of the, the PLA under Xi? Well, well, thanks. Like uh, David and Evan, I'm also a fan of the World Affairs Council, so thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I, I think this uh, idea of contradictions in China is one that I'll pick up on also. Uh, so the first thing I'll just say a couple of words about is how do Chinese view their own national security situation, but let me be more specific, their external security situation. And I think that there are two words uh, that capture the two different strains of thought in China and Beijing about that. And those two words are both triumphalism on the one hand and trepidation on the other when thinking about their external security situation. So first, triumphalism. 
it is a heady time to be a Chinese in so many ways. Uh, they, they feel good about the fact that they have the world's uh, second largest economy. Uh, they are now an international actor of consequence uh, on most uh, large international security issues, whereas before they were on the periphery. And of course, after 20 years of funded and focused military modernization, uh, Xi Jinping and the Politburo Standing Committee now have more military options than they've ever had before. So there are a lot of people in China, in my circles of national security, civilians and military people, who are feeling pretty good about where China is. Frankly, uh, no one is, I don't think anybody is more surprised to see where the Chinese are in the national security system of the world and the Chinese themselves. Uh, if you would have, as an example, if you would have told me 10 years ago that the Chinese Navy would be in the Gulf of Aden for, what, six, seven, eight consecutive years now doing anti-piracy operations, I would have said you're crazy. But there they are. And connected to the idea of a glo you know, China with a global economy is now a China that has increasingly globalized political interests and increasingly globalized security interests. So it's a heady time uh, to be a Chinese in the military and the civilian security sector. But it's also a time of great trepidation. And, and this is what, where I, get very disturbed speaking with my interlocutors and reading what they, they put out in their own, their own media. Uh, under Xi Jinping, the Chinese security establishment, especially the PLA, believes that their external and peripheral security environment is being degraded and that they're in trouble. So what do they see when they look out? What, what's driving this, this concept or this, this argument or assessment that their security situation is being degraded? First. Uh, they see, uh, they cite the U.S. rebalance towards Asia. Uh, they look at uh, the U.S.'s military and diplomatic uh, initiatives in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia and say, this is aimed at us. Uh, they look at the U.S. attempt to strengthen its alliances and they say, this is aimed at us. Uh, this is a pattern, by the way, this is aimed at us. Uh, my, my Chinese friends in the Chinese military are notorious for seeing the acorn but imagining the oak tree. Uh, they, they look at Japan's uh, decisions to uh, reform its approach to defense, redefining what constitutes collective self-defense or selling arms abroad, and they see a samurai behind every bush. Uh, they look at what, uh, what uh, the Philippines and the Vietnamese are doing in the maritime domain, and they blame the U.S. So, so they, have all, they see all these things going on. They worry about Afghanistan post-2014. When the U.S. leaves Afghanistan, they're worried. Afghanistan borders China. And we've been doing a great job for China uh, cleaning up the terrorists in the Wakhan Corridor and out in the uh, north northwest uh, frontier areas of Pakistan. Uh, so they worry about that. But more, but more than anything else, they worry, about, they worry about their maritime challenges. Now, all of a sudden, China, which had always been a continental power, is all of a sudden becoming a maritime power and a maritime country as well. This is difficult for them to get their heads around, and frankly, it's been difficult for us to get our heads around here in Washington, especially in the Pentagon. And so China finds itself a party to uh, multiple, multiple disputes over sovereignty in the South China Sea and East China Sea. So for all of these reasons and others that I could talk about, uh, the Chinese uh, see that their peripheral security environment is being degraded. The one thing that Chinese analysts don't attribute to the degradation of their uh, peripheral security environment is their own behaviors, actions, and policies. Right? Uh, it's, it's, it seems to be beyond the, uh, the scope of their mandate to put anything in the public domain that says maybe our policies have attracted these unwanted responses. So, so I'm, very, I'm very concerned about this and frankly some of the language that's been coming out of China over the last year under Xi Jinping's uh, tutelage, his, his uh, rule over the Central Military Commission, it's very disturbing. It's disturbing. They talk about their security situation as being grim as being stark. On the 1st of August, 2014, which is the anniversary of the founding of the Red Army in 1927, the People's Liberation Army Daily told the Chinese armed forces that about this grim security environment and ended with the sentence that said, and it is not beyond the realm of possibility that chaos and even conflict could break out on the doorstep of our country. Can you imagine if the Pentagon put out something like that? So that's pretty, this is pretty tough, pretty tough words. So, um, so I'm, pretty, I'm pretty worried. Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, we have 
have a lot of good cooperative activities going on with the Chinese on the others, uh, there is a, a segment in their national security uh, establishment uh, that, that, is, uh, th that are thinking very bad and disturbing thoughts. Uh, just a couple of um, moments on Xi Jinping and the PLA. The, the Chinese People's Liberation Army is also an area where Xi Jinping has moved out very quickly to uh, put his imprimatur on that particular system, uh, more so really than Hu Jintao, his predecessor. Now, you, I think most of you know his biography and his links to the PLA. He's a princeling, he's the son. His father was a revolutionary martyr, a contemporary of Mao Zedong's, very well revered. His wife, Peng Liyuan, is a major general in the People's Liberation Army. She's a, a nationally known singer and she's part of the general political department's song and dance troupe. Uh, as a young man, Xi Jinping did, th did two or three years uh, in the PLA for a short period of time, but he was the executive assistant to the Ministry of Defense and Long March veterans, veteran Gung Biao. And of course, as vice president of the PRC in 2010, he spent two years on the Central Military Commission. So he's no uh, newcomer to the Chinese People's Liberation Army. And so he's put his, his stamp on the PLA in various ways, in ways that have surprised me. Frankly, uh, within two years of taking control of the Central Military Commission, it, it is remarkable to me to see how the cult of Xi Jinping in the PLA has been uh, propagated throughout the armed forces. You know, usually the expositions of a military commission chairman on national defense and army building are published after his tenure is over. Xi Jinping's have been published while he's still serving within the first two years. And even as we speak here uh, this past weekend uh, at, at the t in the town of Gu Tian, where Mao Zedong made a famous speech to the PLA in 1929, exhorting it to be both red and expert, right? Xi Jinping went to Gu Tian and called all the leaders of the PLA political system together. You know, the symbology of that is extremely, extremely uh, uh, important. Are these the pledges of allegiance? No, and you know, there's there's a lot. Now let me let me. This idea, you know, the, the Western media and the Hong Kong media have made a big deal out of uh, the idea that Chinese generals have been pledging personal loyalty to Xi Jinping. Uh, I, I take exception to that. If you read what's been uh, written about what the PLA officers are writing about, it's not Xi Jinping that they're pledging allegiance to. They are throwing their support behind the extensive military modernization program that Xi Jinping has laid out for them, again, going back to both David and uh, Evan's uh, reference to the third plenum back in November 2013, much to my surprise as a lifelong PLA watcher, the third plenum had a significant and important military modernization component that I was not expecting to see because this plenum was supposed to be about economics and social issues. And oh, by the way, over the past 50 years, whenever the PLA has gone into a period of catalyzed or re-energized military modernization, it's not the Central Committee that has announced it, but the Central Military Commission. So what's going on here? What's, why the Central Committee announcing this and not the Military Commission? Again, going back to what Evan and David said, internal resistance. Left to their own devices, the PLA will not make the tough decisions it needs to make to become the joint warfighting force that it believes it needs to become. Indeed, I like to say that Xi Jinping has given the PLA its own Goldwater Nichols moment. Uh, just as it took an act of Congress in 1986, the Goldwater Nichols Defense Reorganization Act, to force the Pentagon, the Pentagon to become the joint force it is today, because left to their own devices, they do not play well with other children, right? Uh, it, it's taking an act of the Central Military, of the Central Committee of the CCP, and Xi Jinping himself personally, to tell the PLA, get this done. And what is it they need to get done, and I'll wrap up with that, to become a military force that can wage joint operations in the maritime and aerospace battle space dimensions. This is a strategic paradigm shift of monumental proportions for a military which since 1927 when it was founded has been a ground force centric military. But a ground force centric military is not what a China with global economic interests, what a China with global political interests needs. So uh, to, to uh, steal a line from Betty Davis in All About Eve, fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> bumpy ride indeed. Let's go straight to the questions because we're not long on time. 
<clears throat> We've got a mic coming to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, exceptional presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. If I was sitting in Beijing and I had U.S. spy planes flying along my coast every day, if I had a, a U.S. base in Sing Singapore, in Yakuska, and I taking Marines uh, to Australia, and if I was Japan and I was them, and I see Japan building up, who are they building up against? The answer is obvious. Nobody can deny that. It's China. I just have a, a question. You were talking about the, um, my name's Ed Martins, I'm from World Boston. And I have a question, you were talking about the banking sector. How much of their, their profits come from real estate? I, uh, people I know in China say, if you think we had a real estate bubble here, they said, you have no idea what's going on in China. And, you know, I, and I've seen reports of whole empty cities and things like that. And how much of their profits in, in, are, are related to that? And just, to, you were talking also about, you know, people being kicked off their land. Is there a really proper land registry in China? I, we, I, I, that's a problem. I've heard they, I know they had that in Greece. They found out we didn't really know who owned land. Do they have a proper one in China, too, which would relate to the banking sector? Right. Um, I'll, I'll take the land one first. So constitutionally, all the land belongs to the state, right, because this is a socialist system. Um, as a practical matter, individuals can lease land I can't, I'm slipping my mind, but I, I forgot what the terms of the lease are, but it's several, it's like 60 years, 70 year lease, 70 year lease, I think it's a 70 year lease. Um, the problem is not so much, it's not just land issues, it's a system of what they call household registration um, that essentially is a legacy of the socialist economy of the 1950s and that in far too many ways ties people uh, to the place where they are legally registered. In Chinese, the system is called hukou. Okay, so a hukou is your legal place of residency. In the United States, if you live in Florida and you want to pick up and move, to, where, actually, it's usually the other way around. If you live in Ohio and you want to move to Florida, or you, you live in, you know, you're a winter Texan or wh whatever it is, you want to move to the Sun Belt, uh, you pick up and you move. Um, the problem in China is even though there are hundreds of millions of people who are migrants who have moved for economic opportunity, legally, it is very difficult to near impossible to take your hukou your legal registration with you. And the reason that's a problem is that a lot of social welfare services in China, health care, uh, public schools, public, public schools uh, access to affordable housing, um, these things are tied to the legality of your hukou. So if you're one of these 120, 130 million migrants who's picked up and moved from a rural area to a city, you're working in a factory, you may be doing very well. Uh, you may be getting paid very well, but the problem is you don't have a legal urban hukou. And without that, uh, a lot of your income, such as it is, even if you can even afford it, is being spent in ways that urban residents don't have. So what China needs um, is land reform, but land reform is tied to normalizing the labor market through reforming this system of hukou. So that the most productive people, the people who move to a city, uh, but are college graduates, for example, should be able to get an urban hukou much more easily. So then they legally can have their families with them, they can get schooling for their children. So, so that's the problem. It's not just land, it's really land tied to the labor market. And the point I was making was about land seizure, and that's really tied to the financial system, which gets you to, point, to your, your first point, which is about real estate. Um, in China, I, I frame this in terms of mayors, right? You can't, you know, you don't have bonds, you can't do, you can't do general obligation bonds, you don't have property taxes, but you can broaden this to the system more broadly. I made that point about people putting their money in deposit accounts where they get a negative return on their savings. Sounds like a bad deal. So why do people put their money in deposit accounts? They put their money in deposit accounts because there really are no investment products in China. There's, there's really very few other places to put your money. So there aren't really wealth management products. There are no long, there are no 20 year treasuries. Uh, there isn't really a government debt market that you can invest in. And so without these products, people either put their money in banks or they put their money in real estate. And that has helped to inflate this real estate asset bubble in China that your friend was talking about when they said, oh, if you think you got a bubble there, you should see the bubble here. 
a lot of money, a lot of people have their money tied up in either investment properties or in second properties or third properties. Uh, and then for local people that use real estate at the government level to finance infrastructure projects, you get what you were referring to, which are these ghost cities, uh, where the demand never matched the supply. Um, now, I think uh, the government's trying to deal with that first through legal measures, restricting second properties, third properties. Um, another is to broaden the way the mortgage market, to, to change the way the mortgage market functions in China. Um, uh, and then third, by trying artificially to keep demand inflated uh, in China. But this is, I think, of all the areas in the, in the economy, the one that policymakers worry most about in terms of near-term asset bubbles in China. Um, and near-term asset bubbles are a problem because the government is going to be stuck with the, with the bill for that. Does that make sense? Does that answer good? Okay. I'd like to involve each of you in a question because I think there are elements that can touch on politics, economics, anyway, security, if not national security, domestic security, and that's Hong Kong. Let's finish on Hong Kong. Do we expect a peaceful solution, and what should the U.S. stance be? Um, well, uh, a peaceful solution, what does the U.S. stance should be? Well, the second part of that is easier to respond to. The U.S. stance, in my view, should be much more firm and vocal and public than it has been, um, and it should be done in tandem with other countries, most notably the United Kingdom. And it should um, uphold the 1997 uh, agreements, the joint declaration signed between Britain and China and the basic law, um, which China has broken in spirit, if not uh, in letter, with its August 31st white paper decision on this nominating council. So I think our government and other governments, uh, including the UK, oddly enough, uh, have been too uh, mute and restrained on this very serious problem. Um, that said, you know, uh, how do we, we expect this to play out? Well, after sort of post-APEC, or pre-APEC and post-APEC, uh, I think the fact that we have this meeting next week has probably been a factor in the Chinese government's thinking, um, you know, to either suppress or clear out. There's, there are choices between allowing it to continue and suppressing it the way we saw in 1989. There are various means to clear out demonstrators uh, that they haven't tried to do yet. Um, but had they tried to do that, it would have rebounded against uh, the image of Beijing, not so much the Hong Kong government, on the eve of the APEC meeting and the summit with Obama. So post APEC, there may be a greater, that's just a hypothesis, may not be factual, but post APEC, Beijing's hand is freer, at least on the PR side of this. And the um, frustration, the tolerance of the Hong Kong government, and for that matter, the Beijing government, has run quite thin. And I would suspect, you know, they cannot tolerate three major parts of Hong Kong occupied indefinitely. I'm not sure what government could do that. Our government couldn't either. Uh, the question is, how do you deal with it? And we will probably see some forward movement on, on the physical dismantling of these demonstration sites, I would guess, after the meetings next week. Be my guess. Is there an economic dimension, or even in the sourcing of this problem, which seems to be constitutional, but inequality that you mentioned, Evan, in China, also pertains in Hong Kong? Oh, you mean as a driver of protest? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Wall Street Journal had a great graphic about three weeks ago. You can probably Google it. It was basically about social and economic inequality in Hong Kong. So absolutely, that's a driver of some of the protests. But I also think there are various, as David said, there are some very fundamental constitutional issues here. Right? I mean, the basic law said that the, ulti the basic law is the document that Britain and China negotiated at the time of the handover. And there are some ambiguities in there, but the, ba the language basically says the ultimate aim is the election of the chief executive of Hong Kong through universal suffrage. So if that's the ultimate aim, it's the ultimate aim. And um, I think the reality is that there are people in Hong Kong who are going to demand that that ultimate aim be realized. That the, what happened ultimately, the, the timeline on ultimately is a lot shorter than uh, Beijing's timeline, and Beijing's timeline probably was never. So, um, so that, uh, that is the challenge. My guess is, I mean, if I were going to walk in their shoes, my guess is they're hoping it'll just fizzle out. Right. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether it does. It hasn't so far, but that's presumably what they're betting on. 
Do we have a final question out there? Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary Mendoza. I'm from rural Boston. What effect will the sex ratio imbalance of a lot more men in, to women in China have on its, uh, on its society? Did everybody hear the question? Oh, sex ratio. Yeah. G that's gender it. imbalance and yeah, its effect I, on Chinese society. Yeah, I think it's already having an impact on, on society. The, the uh, uh, lack of marriageable uh, uh, males, uh, males who can't get married, uh, is, is a social stability problem from the perspective of, of the party. Uh, we have human trafficking once again in, in females across provinces within China. Uh, we have uh, wealthy Chinese going abroad to find, to find wives. I think it's a, a destabilizing issue, and it's also a, a significant one that, that has to be dealt with. You know, uh, you know if, if you ever go to a Beijing airport and see all the, the great American church groups who are adopting children from China, there are never any boys leaving the country. Right, it's all the girls. So, uh, so this is this is significant. It's also it it also uh, actually has an impact on the Chinese military. Uh, one of the reasons that I've been told by the political commissars that they continue to keep so many conscripts in the PLA is that they don't want a lot of young men with high levels of testosterone with no wives being demobilized and sent into the countryside with no work. And so, uh, I mean, there's <laughs> there's there may be an element of truth to that. China is not the only country confronting that. India is another example, and there's interesting. There's some interesting research on, you know, what kind of the social consequences of of, of sex ratios and sex imbalances. Um, but there's a flip side to that too, which is the World Bank has a lot of interesting work on on women's empowerment in an economy and what it means in terms of productivity uh, and so on. And so, frankly. Um, you know, there are other levels of social inequality in China, too. And so the flip of that is not just the question of men, but also how do you empower women within the economy, um, especially within the growing private sector economy. Greater. A greater valuing of women has it led to a greater. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know, but you know, the, I, I recently heard a joke in China that if you want to have har harmony in, in the world, you, you don't argue with your wife at home, you don't uh, argue with your boss at work, and you don't challenge the United States in international affairs. There we go. That's so, a nice way to end <laughs> this panel. Let's thank Dave Finkelstein, Evan Feigenbaum, and Professor David Schambach. Okay. Thanks.